You're listening to Health Innovators, a podcast and video show about the leaders, influencers, and early adopters who are shaping the future of healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy Mooney. Welcome back to the show, Health Innovators. On today's episode, I'm sitting down with Joe Buffone, who is the co-founder and CEO of Anexus Health. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thanks so much, Dr. Roxy. I appreciate you having me. Oh, it is good to have you here. And I am so anxious to have this conversation about what you're doing in the marketplace today. Um, I have a lot of health innovators that come on the show and they're sharing their commercialization journey, which of course we will talk about. Um, But a lot of those innovations, um, some of the challenges we have with adoption is access to care. And so being able to talk about that at um, in depth with you today is, is really exciting and so important. So um, for our listeners who don't know who you are, just start off by telling us um, a little bit about your background and what you've been innovating these days. Sure. So I have, I spent a lot of time, much more time than I'd like to admit in the farmer world doing a bunch of different things. And yeah. I'll, I'll leave it to a really short um, statement about what was most important during that time. And it was a focus on access. It was the focus on access to care and the, from the pharma side of the business, right? It's therapeutics and such. And I got a chance to learn a lot about the tools and services that were available, some of the challenges in the marketplace, getting those tools and services to the patients, right? And often in complex disease states through the provider organizations. So I spent a lot of time in pharma. I stepped out in 2009 to be an operator and started a company with a group of people called On Point Oncology. And we were focused on improving access to care, but we just took more of a data approach to that. And mm-hmm. then I started with my co-founder, Brad Frazier, a Nexus Health. And our focus is on technology and services to allow for patients to get the access services like financial assistance, free drug, reimbursement services to get the care that they need and deserve in the complex disease states like oncology where we started. But now because we're launching into health systems and institutions, we've expanded into 13 additional different disease states. So that's the short version of my background, Dr. Roxy. That's awesome. So where are you now? When did you start the company and where you are, where are you in the commercialization process now? Yeah. So we started actually building the technology platform itself back in 2014. We launched in earnest in 2000, the beginning of 2018. And our focus is from a commercialization perspective is to provide a technology platform, an enterprise platform or services, the people to really conduct the complete cycle of managing financial assistance, start to finish, right? So we started, as I stated, building this and offering it commercially to oncology. So oncology providers, and by providing the tools and services to make sure that you're making it easier for these provider organizations on behalf of the patients to get commercial copay, charitable foundation help, not just finding it, but making sure you manage the process to through fulfillment, that's where we were. That's where we are commercially right now. Our goal is to be the enterprise platform at provider organizations to manage start to finish administrative logistics as part of the patient's care journey that they just don't have tools and services for right now. So our business model is a SaaS model to provider organizations, a services model to really do the work. Some of these administrative functions that exist Um, to remove financial toxicities for the providers and the patients. And then we're a transaction model to pharma and life science. So we connect with the valuable programs that exist in this space and we bring them into the provider workflow to allow them to be managed more effectively and efficiently for patients. So I think that, you know, as a whole, everyone in the audience kind of understands, you know, the affordability and access. Um, But just in case there's some newbies out there that are maybe technologists and engineers entering in the healthcare market, but aren't familiar, what do you mean when you say financial toxicity? And then help us understand that issue and landscape, like kind of where the market is with this challenge. um, And why is that an even something that we're talking about? Yeah, so I, I can I can start with the end in mind, right? And why are we talking about it and what's going on? 
So there are statistics out there from many surveys that have been done. And, and there's an average that you see in these surveys of about 30%. 30% of patients don't get the care in oncology. So we're just talking about oncology. Mm -hmm. um, they don't get the care that's intended for them. So the physician decides, okay, we work the, they work the patient up and they decide the therapeutic course. As I stated, 30%. 30% yeah. of patients don't take their medication at all or as it's intended because they can't afford it. That's financial toxicity. The other repercussions of financial toxicity are they choose to get the care. They take out a second mortgage. They file bankruptcy. There are all kinds of economic complications in these disease states that are very expensive. So that's financial toxicity. Now, the landscape and why there was such an opportunity for us in this space is because there are many options. Life science organizations provide incredible value as it relates to copay programs. There's wonderful charitable foundation organizations out there that provide all kinds of help, but there's hundreds of different options. Actually, there's thousands of different yeah. options that we manage the content on within our platform. And it's all one off, right? It's all, you know, different portals, different URLs. And so provider organizations in these sophisticated disease states that need for the, the handholding for the patient through their journey, they, they don't have any tools before an excess health. And there's others that have followed us in the marketplace. So they're using post-it notes. They're using spreadsheets. They're using free text notes in the EHR and the rev cycle management system. So it's a mess. And ultimately, you know, right? If you don't have something, if you don't have a place to manage things comprehensively, it's not being managed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that's so interesting is just a couple of weeks ago, and I don't know if this is new or they've been doing this for a while, but just a couple of weeks ago, I went into Walgreens and uh, it was just nothing in the pharmacy, just checking out at the reg regular register. And they tried to sell a credit card. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, why is Walgreens offering me a credit card? And so just through the dialogue with the cashier, the reason why they were doing it is to help people pay for their medication. And I thought, gosh, are we really doing people a favor by giving them a credit card? And who knows no. what that interest rate yeah. is? to pay for their medication. This, this seems maybe like help in the beginning, but I'm not sure it's the long-term solution that patients really, really need to be able to pay for this affordable medic un unaffordable medication or very expensive medication. It's true. And, and it's interesting that you say it that way, right? Like the, the alternatives to pay for this care. And because of the fact that there are robust options available out there, Sometimes the, the market thinks, okay, if we could just create something to manage just finding what's available, that yeah. would be good. One of the things that we found when we were building this technology and we were sitting down with the users, we were sitting down with provider organizations to try to understand how they were managing this stuff or not managing it. We ran into a situation where even if they were going and finding assistance for patients, it's like a payer. It wasn't utilized. As we started to look at our analytics and data, we would see large amounts of money that weren't utilized in provider organizations because they, they didn't have the tools to say, I do have this basic additional payer or bank account for patients. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really messy and it's a shame, right? And you're going into a pharmacy and you're seeing these credit card options and all of these other options that exist out there before you would even consider something like that. Sure. Yeah. So when I think of your business, um, I think of a couple of things. One is, I think, uh, uh, something that a lot of businesses um, are facing that are trying to transform healthcare, like through the provider, is they are extremely overwhelmed, <laughs> um, right, and understaffed, and you know, just experiencing the pain of the labor shortages that we're having in the marketplace. So um, I, I can see the value of your two pronged business model um, because what I have heard over the years is a lot of providers of like who has time, who has time to help the patient. I mean, like we want to prescribe the drug and we want to be able to help them find it, but we just don't have the capacity or bandwidth to be able to help them explore every single patient or those even 30% of the patients explore all of these different options, especially if you're doing something that's like a, a manual process or even having time to even log into a system. You nailed it. And it's, it's interesting. We, we thought as technologists going into this, that if we build the best technology and it's just so cool and easy to utilize, we're just going to blow this space up, right? Yep. 
Yeah. And we got some really good initial utilization and we learned our lesson, right? We learned this lesson and then COVID hit and it was getting worse and worse. Thank God we really saw the writing on the wall sure. and you, you described it, right? And we had to stand in the gap and help. And so we launched at Paro, our services division. Yeah. And, and, and I'll take a step back. It really, it was interesting because what we do is provide a significant revenue stream for financial assistance to the providers, right? Because a lot of times, if the, the patient can't pay for it, it's going to bad debt. It's going to write off, right? And so okay. we're getting, yeah, we're get, we're getting more revenue in the door for provider organizations taking that burden off of the patient. But even in that scenario, they still couldn't staff it correctly, right? So it's sometimes not just about numbers; it's about qualified staff to use technology, even if it's easy. So we launched at Paro and it's been fantastic. And we've seen an incredible lift in the number of patients that you said are worked up, right? And that's what's most important. It's the patients, right? We don't want to leave a patient behind. Everyone that walks in the door where Ed Paro is providing the service of managing financial assistance with our technology, every single patient with an intent to treat is being worked up in the system. And if you think about it, I guess, you know, people might not care as much where you have a, pay, a person that makes a reasonable amount of money, but in that scenario, they make a reasonable amount of money and they're not budgeting correctly, or they get this massive bill that's going to cost them a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. That's enough to set anyone sideways. So yeah. we're working everyone up and financial toxicity, it's bad for whoever it is, and it will disrupt lives and it'll impact care and it'll have a negative impact on outcomes. So at launching the services division, you know, we thought, okay, we're going to probably be at around 20 to 40% of our customers will be at Paro customers. For 2023, our goal is 60 to 70% of our customer base will actually be using the services, our people, to conduct this, this work for uh, their patients on behalf of their patients. That makes sense. Um, so, so on this show, we talk a lot about the business of commercializing innovation, right? <clears throat> so I want to dig a little bit deeper into um, the idea of being a platform business. We're seeing more and more platform type businesses um, in healthcare that is certainly growing. There's um, a, not that you did it for this reason, but there is an exponential valuation of an organization that is a platform business with all of the network effects compared to other business models. So just kind of talk about maybe um, what were some of the things that you were wait, considering and debating back and forth, whether you became a service business or a technology company or a platform business, and then maybe some of the concessions that you've had to make or not make because of where the market was versus really what, maybe what you originally set out to uh, achieve. Yeah. So from, I just want to make a statement. I'm a capitalist and I'm not concerned about or worried about saying that I'm a capitalist and because I'm yeah. doing it for the right reason. I sure. think Dr. Roxy, um, it feels like you're the same as me. I, I want to make money and I want to make a difference and we want to make that money and we want to reinvest into our company so that we can generationally disrupt sure. what's going on around healthcare. Absolutely. So our business model is really important or otherwise our investors wouldn't continue to invest or we wouldn't get new investors to be able to expand what we want to do. So as I stated, we went at this from a technology perspective mm -hmm. and we, as we were thinking as investors think, right. And the valuation of a tech company, more important than just a straight <laughs> shot uh, services company. But as we were thinking about building the tech and what it should look like, we knew that the gaps existed in sophisticated disease states and in institutions and health systems at the provider level, right? The management tools didn't exist there. And we started to look at the landscape and looked at, okay, there are platforms, enterprise platforms that exist in these provider organizations and the three main platforms, the EHR, the yeah. RevCycle, and the pharmacy dispensing software. Those three systems are not intended to manage the administrative logistics of the patient's care journey. Right? Sure. The best thing that they offer often for the things outside of what they're designed for is the free text note section. And we've been fighting against that since meaningful use, right? And trying right. to get people to put things in fields and drop downs. So ultimately, we identified, okay, financial assistance is really something that we can go after and we can help manage the administrative toxicities 
associated with, meaning they don't have the tools to manage all of these administrative functions or the people, and in turn, reduce the financial toxicities. But as we were thinking that through, we thought, there's a lot of other functions that they need help managing the administrative and logistical things. So we're going we're gonna to build out functionality that allows for provider organizations to manage the cell and gene space, to manage the remote nature of oral therapeutics, the testing, diagnostics, and genomic profiling space. And those are the areas that we've targeted because they're heavily laden in administrative and logistical functions. So we are in provider organizations. They're using our platform alongside of, and we're connected to those three main systems. So ultimately we have that credibility, right? We have documented a documented history that we can build a platform that sits alongside these other platforms. We're gonna expand that platform once we expand it into the other areas, we're already doing it in, in the financial assistance space. Yep. We've created the ecosystem, user experience to manage this. So ultimately, what's our business model on the life science side? It's we connect with them digitally. So all of their programs and services, we're connecting right to their hub service provider, their copay yep. vendor, whatever it is. And so it's point and click. Everything's pre-filled because we're connected to the provider systems. goes out across the wire. We receive response back. We receive the spend down and whatever it may be. So ultimately, as you hear me developing this, our model is to be the ecosystem that in our technology network, all of these services and data products related to administrative functions of the patient's care journey will be managed through us. And we, chose, we, talk, we charge a toll for every time that happens in our system. We are charging providers. I got to tell you, I would give it away for free all day long. And so would my co-founder, Brad Frazier, to providers, because I feel like that's like what we need to do to get patient care. But, you know, right. I got a two-sided business model, so I have to do it the right way. And, you know, we all have to run a business and we have a lot of lawyers helping us run business and telling us how to do it. <laughs> hey, it's Dr. Roxy here with a quick break from the conversation. Are you trying to figure out what moves you need to make to survive and thrive in the new COVID economy? I want every health innovator to find their most viable and profitable pivot strategy, which is why I created the COVID Proof Your Business Pivot Kit. The Pivot Kit is a step-by-step -step framework that helps you find your best pivot strategy. It walks you through six categories you need to examine for a 360-degree view of your business. I call them the six critical pivot lenses. As you make your way through this comprehensive kit, you'll be armed with the tools, tips, and strategies you need to make sure you can pivot with speed without missing out on critical details and opportunities. Learn more at legacy-dna.com backslash kit. I think it's really important because a lot of innovators out there are faced with these di dilemmas and decisions when it comes to mapping out their business model and all of the different paths to profit that they can take. And sometimes the most um, uh, greatest path to profit um, is not necessarily where the market wants to be, right? So recognizing that you have to have the service model added to the, uh, the platform, I think is really important. But I think also at the same time, time, you didn't really have to forego your vision um, of this being a platform business, that this, you know, kind of doing a technology co company with a platform business that then adds on a service model, but then ultimately still <laughs> maintains being a platform business in the end is, is just, it's a, it's a, it's not always black and white, um, and, and it's a lot of wrestling and going back and forth of what's going to be the right choice for your organization going forward. So it's it's very it valuable is. conversation for our audience. It is, and it's interesting. One of the things that um, I think when we went into this, and, and if you factor in the raise of money and the cash burn and everything you're yeah. doing as a startup company and a technology company, you, you still have... When you're managing the cash flow, you're managing unit economics. And when you have two different models within your business model, it's two different unit economics, right? So if we're doing something for provider organizations that is tech focused, that's service focused, that's two different ways that we're making money. That's two different sets of cost equations that we're factoring in there. And then you've got the whole life science model. But everything we do at the provider level, everything that we're doing with the services model amps up what we're doing on the life science right. side. So right. we're constantly managing, right? The investor conversation over the unit economics of our services division at Paro was not what everyone wanted in the beginning. And we've made changes and adjustments to that, but it's really cool that you point that out. I mean, there's some decisions that you 
you have to make that we're making right now that you're like, no, right? We went out and raised money. Give me enough time to pull, figure this thing out. Nope, we got to adjust around the unit economics of that particular thing in the moment. So it's been, yeah, I, we're living this right now. So it's interesting sure. that you bring that up. Yeah, yeah. Um, it Yeah, it's definitely a, a common dilemma. And then when you are working with investors, you know, they have their own goals as well, right? That you're talking about. And so just balancing, um, you know, what they want and what you want. <laughs> um, so let's talk about that uh, capital raise journey. What was that? What was it like for you um, raising funding? You know, a lot of the listeners in the audience that are early stage um, can be at various places. And so I love being able to, you know, shine a spotlight on the reality of that journey, because I think that it's very educational and encouraging and for other people that are in the trenches right now. Yeah. So I think that the one word I would use is exhausting. And I don't, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want to discourage anyone. Um, and, and I think the other side of that, I would say persistence is most important. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we bootstrapped it. We did a seed round. We did a series A and we did a, a series B. And, you know, each had its own challenges. Sure. The one thing that I would take away from it, holistically speaking, is you have to be strategic with your time, right? Because we have we had full time jobs, and then we had another full time job raising money, which actually was more than a full time job. Right, there were so right. many times that we didn't want to take the call. There were so many times we thought, okay, we've got to prioritize our time, and maybe we shouldn't investigate this. I can tell you that two of the three raises were situations where we didn't want to take the call, we didn't want to schedule the meeting. And we did, and mm -hmm. it paid off in spades for us. So I would say yeah. it's exhausting. Get ready for the grind, but be persistent. If you care about this, if you're passionate about it, go for it and keep going for it hard and do whatever you can to get to that place. If you really feel like you have something difference making for the, the market, I would say also, and I think we're, we're doing it again right now. And I said, we wouldn't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> never enough. say never, right? Lesson <laughs> learned. Never say never. <laughs> yeah, but raise enough money. Right. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. we were, I think we were, even though as a second, a, 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 um, second go around operator, um, the business before was a little different. We didn't have to raise money, but we had a lot of people around us that were advising us that have raised money. And even though they were telling us, you know, raise more money, if you can, we still were taking an approach that, okay, let's take a more conservative approach to it. I don't know. I guess it took us a couple of times to learn, but raise more money. Make sure it's sound and you're not going to raise the money in the market if it doesn't make sense. But right. Don't cut yourself short to go back to another raise too early, right? Or just build in some things into what you're considering as it relates to what you have to do in the next year or two, whatever it may be. So um, exhausting, what persistence, and raise more. What were you thinking? Were you thinking that it'll be easier, uh, that you'll be able to accomplish it or accomplish it faster if you don't ask for as much um, up front? I think that, um, so for me personally, I think there was a bunch of different factors. And and Brad, uh, I, you know, Fraser, my my co-founder I referred to, we, we come at things a little differently, but we are aligned around... Um, many things. And I think one of the things that he and I kept thinking about were, okay, the people that are part of this with us, we want to manage their equity appropriately. We want to raise money at the right time. We want to raise money at the right valuation. And I think that we were overly focused on the valuation in that moment in time. I think you have to be, you have to pay attention to that, but yeah. this thing that we're doing now, it's the valuation of what it's going to be is even far beyond what we expected it to be. If, if things play right. out, so I yeah. think just make sure you got your vision down on what the valuation could be and don't don't shortcut yourself. Sure. So you you talked about um, some additional services that you will integrate into the platform or offer on the service model that's going to help you with expanding and scaling the business. Um, you know, I think also another 
challenge that innovators face over time is, you know, packaging that all together as kind of the larger vision when you're raising money, but then not trying to execute on all of the pieces and parts at the same time and having to spread your attention and all of your resources um, across that. So it sounds like you guys have been successful with having a um, more simplified product, simplified target audience, and then expanding that over time. Once you've had some type of, um, you know, market share or penetration in the market. Yeah, I, I can tell you that where we sit right now, my personal opinion is we should have been expanding into what we call version 2.0 of the assist point technology platform to bring in more functions outside of financial assistance and other access services like free drug I mentioned but we were very thoughtful to not be distracted from our priority of managing the things that we're doing right yeah. now really well end to end. So we we do, we have this big vision of where we want to go. And I think like for me as this entrepreneur, and I feel like I'm a little bit of a visionary, we just need to push into that next step because then we're going to be actually stickier and, and our growth will happen more rapidly, but holy crap. Like some of the things that we're working on right now is just to make sure we think we're building for scale. But when you go from 15 to 200 employees in a really short period of time, that doesn't seem like a lot to maybe some in the audience. But right. That was a lot for us. And we thought we were building things for scale. We had to redo some things. Sure. Yeah. So absolutely. We have setting your priorities and making sure you're not outgrowing what is most important in the moment for market success and what the market needs you get distracted and that's, you know, that's how things blow up easy on you. Sure. So the other thing that I kind of hear you saying as well is, you know, um, you know, selling to providers is no easy feat. <laughs> Getting in front of them um, and persuading them to buy is certainly complex. Um, of, of course, you have your, you know, pharma experience to rely upon in, you know, past life. Um, but, you know, that's not an easy feat. It certainly has become more complicated since the, during the pandemic. And I think even more, e either more or just as complicated today with, um, you know, all of the challenges that have been, have resulted from the pandemic. So, what I think of is that it's a lot easier for you when you're thinking of scaling the business for you to be able to go, okay, what are the other problems we can solve for our existing customer base, <laughs> as opposed to just having your entire growth strategy tied to getting more provider customers <laughs> and try new acquisit customer acquisition in such a difficult market of really just even getting in front of those stakeholders. And especially when you're talking about um, health system owned providers. For sure. So I, I have to tell you that you, you nailed a, a big part of our business model, but provider growth and uptake is massive for us. And I'll give you an example. So yeah. our, our technology network, um, we basically measure it by the number of providers in the mm -hmm. organizations that we're serving. So we right now have just shy of 2000 providers represented in our technology network. And we will, at the end of next year, have over 5,000. And I feel really confident in that because of the uptake and our growth. Like over the last eight months, it's ex ex exponential. And I think that's just because we've hit our stride with the value that we're providing. Yep. That wasn't yep. the case for the first couple of years. Yeah. And so we were trying to hone and figure things out. Now we're and, and figure out, okay, how are we going to make money with our percent of the market but we really are focused on hyper growth. And I think it's just because of our investment in things like data science. Mm -hmm. The things that we're proven out are we're getting more patients on intended care. We're getting them on therapy quicker and we're keeping them on therapy. Think about our business model, right? So yeah. we're serving life science. Wow, that's pretty good. All three of those provider organizations. Right? <laughs> You're making treat, a lot of people happy. <laughs> yeah, they got to treat patients, right? And they got to treat them the right way. Right. And, and we're, we're generating revenue for those provider organizations. So I think the story's got out. I think that we're being better and more sophisticated around our data science to prove the model out. So now the growth that's going on, it, really the issues that we have are making sure that we're doing this growth thing in, as I mentioned before, a scalable fashion. Because the numbers that we have coming in the door, if we take a one-off approach to that growth, we're not gonna be here, right? So the, creating scale around our growth, it's a beautiful, 
a beautiful blessing to have right now, right? Early on, we were scrapping, right? We were scrapping yeah, for any yeah. we could get. Absolutely. I mean, we have a client right now that, you know, based upon their growth projections for next year, they need to hire a thousand plus new people. <laughs> and, you know, that you can only grow <laughs> to the, de depending on what your business model is, especially if you're a service business, you can only grow to the extent that you can actually hire great talent and retain great talent. So that has its inherent challenges. You know, you can sell all the business, but somebody has got to be able to deliver on it. Right. <laughs> oh my God. So true. And if you're, you know, if, if you really have been in the technology game, you can't just say we need to do this and it's done the next day. I guess Twitter's doing that now. <laughs> but you can't you can't do that episode. that's a whole i'm sorry yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you can't just typically say i want to do something and add a feature that takes time and there's a lot there's a lot of process to that that's not just oh, telling yeah. an engineer right before you tell the engineer to do something there's a lot that goes into it Sure. Yep, exactly. Um, so let's, so, um, you know, I have a lot of people ask me, okay, you know, getting those first paying customers is always a huge milestone. And then now that I've got these, you know, um, early customers that, you know, how, how to leverage that for additional growth. So, um, you know, think back if there's any, um, you know, lessons learned or things that you did that really worked out of, you know, how are you taking, you know, 20 customers and turning that into 40? What is it that you were doing strategically and tactically that helped you um, maybe experience that hyper growth? Yeah. So our business model was a had a chicken or egg component to it, right? Because we were trying to build out something that was comprehensive enough to get providers to use it. We were giving it for free in the beginning. Okay. Right? Yeah. And, and yeah. we took this approach that we will charge. We're not going to, you know, do a bait and switch, but we will charge. We just have to figure this out. We had to put people in the seats. We knew yep. our main business model was going to be life science, but think about it. We, how are you going to go sign a life science contract if you don't have any Providers. So we basically said, okay, we're going to go at this and we're going to get put, we're going to put people in the seats. We're going to get provider organizations. Well, if you're an early, early, early stage technology company and your features aren't feature rich, you're selling hard to get them to give you a chance. I think that for us, getting back to the raising money thing, I think we should have spent more time in the investor story. So that we could say, this is what we're going to do for providers. This is what's what we're going to. Well, this is what's going to happen. Project out a little bit more. Do a little bit better with forecasting. With what does this mean if we get a hundred providers or two hundred providers to to launch really in earnest? What impact that's potentially going to have on that life science customer and and the tech right? Because they have innovation budgets, and you can go get that. But you got to you want to have enough to pass that test so that they yeah. see you're going to grow and they're going to want to invest more. I think that we started too early commercializing. I think we started early going to the life science organizations. And I think that we needed to do a better job of raising money because we weren't making money, right? And building that footprint, footprint that provider footprint where it was meaningful enough for us to be able to produce the data to say, yeah, that was a good investment. Mm -hmm. So true. Once we started, once we started doing that, the snowball started rolling. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, think back to some additional lessons learned as we kind of start to wrap up here. Um, second time entrepreneur, rate successfully raised several rounds of funding, have paying customers, have quite a bit of paying customers, and and this next phase of growth is just you know scaling the company as 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 uh, intelligently and as quick as you possibly can. What are some of the lessons that you've learned that you want to share with our audience? I think the biggest lesson learned is making sure that you are investing the way you need to, to find business partners and people. Right? When you start a business with a group, a small group of individuals, it's easy to get caught up in daily grind. It's easy to get caught up in that next feature, that one customer. I need that next customer, right? I need that next thing. Now, the thing yeah. you need is people. You need partners. 
and identify people that are truly partners and have this owner's mindset to come alongside of you to give you the ability to do much more than you could individually. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people read about how important the, the you know, the, the people component of this is. And, you know, I've heard many say this, that you can have the best technology idea and you can even build components of really cool technology. But if you don't have the right people, you're not going anywhere. You're not Absolutely. Going anywhere. People so, don't fail to commercialize innovations most often because they have crappy tech. It's the commercialization decisions along the way that hang people up, all those pitfalls, especially in healthcare, because it ain't easy. Yeah. And the other thing is, is no matter how smart you are, put your ego aside and be willing to learn every day. If you're not trying to learn every day, you think you got it all figured out, your chances of failure are much higher too. Amen. We preach. That's a whole nother episode too. (laughs) 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 Uh, Well, Joe, thank you so much for sharing um, candidly your journey and the Anexus Health story. How can folks get a hold of you after the show if they want to follow up with you? Well, speaking of people, our marketing communications people have done a really good job of making it easy to contact us and find out information. So if you just go to anexushealth.com, you'll see an easy way to get in touch with us and learn a little bit about us, just like you did, Dr. Dr. Roxy, before you even started talking to me. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening. I know you're busy working to bring your life-changing innovation to market, and I value your time and attention. To get the latest episodes on your mobile device automatically, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Thank you for listening, and I appreciate everyone who shared the show with friends and colleagues. See you on the next episode of Health Innovators.